I remember one time when we first moved as a child. Um, we moved from St. Louis to Green Bay, which was to become my home for most of my life when I was five years old. And my parents, to make that trip, they had the 1957 Bel Air, or the uh, 55 Bel Air, excuse me. And the headliner was hanging down in that thing, and the seats were all red because it was an old car. So they decided that they would get a brand new Dodge Dart to make this trip with. Now, that's what they could afford. A Dodge Dart in, in 1964 was a small car. 65, but it was a small car. The thing I liked about it was the push button transmission that it had. That was great. What I didn't like was the hump in the back seat because we had four kids. Now, my daughter, my, my youngest sister, Connie, sat on my mom's lap the whole trip in the front seat, which were bucket seats. Those were not the days of seat belts, and we could get in trouble for doing that. The three oldest kids got put in the back seat. I was the youngest one in the back seat, so guess who got the hump? Didn't we get? I think my back issues today resulted from that hump and that Dodge Dart back all those years ago. And the whole trip, I kept saying, man, I'm uncomfortable. Man, I'm uncomfortable. I'm so uncomfortable. Can you imagine my parents listening to that in St. Louis, the Green Bay, Wisconsin? There came a point when my family turned around and said, I'm going to make you uncomfortable. And you don't shut up, right? Um, we know what it's like to be uncomfortable. Now imagine being taken away from your home against your will and all of your creature comforts that you're used to having taken away from you and it isn't to move like from St. Louis to Green Bay where my parents wanted to go and it was an adventure for us kids. <clears throat> but you're taken by force into a foreign country and you're made to live the way those people do and everything you knew, all of your past is taken away from you and you're forced to live there for 70 years you might be saying to God man I'm uncomfortable this is uncomfortable God this is, and in the midst of this it's getting to be at the end of the 70 years God says to God's people, comfort, oh comfort my people, you're going home, you're going home. That would have been comforting for them, yes? But, he talks about a highway in the wilderness. He's telling them that the way to get home is to make that highway straight and to remove the obstacles that will keep them from going back and living in that covenant relationship with their God again in their own land. He said, if you're going to do it, if you're going to experience my comfort, if you're going to live in your own land again, and if we're going to live in this covenant relationship again, you have to remove the obstacles and make the highway straight. You need to take the crooked paths and straighten them out. You need to lower the mountains and fill the valleys so that there's a level ground. Now I understand this lowering the hills because I ride the elliptical. When I started out on that elliptical, I had a 0% incline. Oh, can I get on that thing and buzz around now? I seem to get those pedals going so fast at 0% incline, I think the thing's going to hop off the ground. But then I move into 20% incline. That's like going up a hill that has a 20% grade. And then I start increasing the resistance. And you know what? It's not so easy to pedal that thing anymore. Because the resistance is there and the incline is there. So he says, level the mountains. Fill in the valleys. Make it an even plane. And the reason is so that all people might see the glory of God together. 
He's talking about the pathway to God still in our world. How people will come to know God. How people will come to experience God. How people will come to see God. And he's saying to all of you, and he's saying to me, you must remove the obstacles. You must make the path straight for people. Do we put obstacles in the way of people coming to know the Lord? There's a song on Christian radio, if you listen to Kalo, it's called Jesus Loves the Sinner. And one of the things that that song says is, as the, the singer is saying is, God, I'm the obstacle that keeps others from coming to you. And he talks about living a divided life. And he said, I profess you, but I'm a sinner, and I often do what I don't profess. I profess faith, but then I don't live faithfully. In other words, his witness, the witness of his actual life, causes the path to be crooked. It causes the path to God to have mountains and valleys because they're looking at what he professes and then what he really does and what he really says. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now he says in the midst of that, God, I know you love me, but my path is crooked. Now I've walked a crooked path and so have you. Amen? You know, you know, how many of you always take the straight way to God? You know what? My faith looks like this. When I'm over here, God says, return to me. So I come back here. And then I'm over here, and the Holy Spirit says, return to me. And I come back. How many times have we separated ourselves from God, and God's grace has brought us back? It's like driving down I-35, coming to Central United Methodist Church, and there are exits all the way. Shawnee Mission Parkway, Johnson Drive, Lamar, 18th Street, 7th Street Expressway. And sometimes in my faith, I'm very good. I stay right on that highway. But there's other times it seems like I get off at every exit. Amen? You know? Oh, a good quick trip will pull me off the highway faster than anything. I don't need gas. And I really don't need that fountain drink that fizzes me up. But we're like that sometimes. We get off. Our pathway is crooked, right? It's crooked. And sometimes I witness and people have to look at me and say, but you get off on the exits. You get off on every exit. You talk about this straight pathway to God. What do we say? you confess God, God will come to you, right? If you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Isn't that our confession? It's a straight path to God. It's just that there's so many exits on the highway. Jesus says the path is narrow. Remember him saying that? The path is narrow. Sometimes I feel like maybe it's a tight walking act. But there are exits. And I get off on them. And praise, we have God. This song says, we have a God who forgives us. We have a God by God's grace who calls us back to the right path, the straight path through the wilderness. Because when you get off, when you're separated from God, that's where you're living, in the wilderness, right? Who wants to build a straight path in, in holy land? You don't need one. You're there. You're at the destination. If you're living righteously, You've done it. You're there. God says build a straight path in the wilderness. In the places where you get off. Where you're separated from me. Where we're far from each other. That's where the straight path needs to be. Amen? When I'm on the exit, I need to get back on the straight highway. So he says when you're in the wilderness, look for the straight path. What's the quickest way between two points? A straight line. Amen? The quickest point between me and God is what? A straight path. She took it today. She confessed Jesus Christ was her Lord and Savior. Amen? She became a sister. She became God's daughter, if you will. She took a straight path. 
Wouldn't it be great if baptism really did wash off sin like some people think? And we'd be sinless? But it doesn't. It's a sign of our relationship with God. He says to fill in every valley. There's been times in my faith where I've been in the valley. I've been in the valley of dry bones. I've been in the valley of, of the shadow of death. I just... You have to confess, sometimes even when our, we have faith, it doesn't always go easy for us. Does it? Sometimes we get down to those valleys, we don't have a washer and dryer, we've got six kids. That's a valley, isn't it? And you don't know what your clothes are piling up, and you don't know what you're living. Sometimes you're living in a car. Right? And that's hard too. That's a valley, isn't it? God tells us that if we're going to make this path straight through the highway, that we need to be people who help fill in the valleys for people. We need to be people that when we see someone walking through the valley of the shadow of death, when we see our brother or sister walking through the valley of dry bones, if we're not there, we need to be the ones that with our faith fill in that valley for them. We pray for them. We do physical things. Our faith is not our faith unless we use it. Amen? Not only to keep ourselves on the straight path so that we can encounter God, but so that we fill in those valleys. Because faith isn't always a mountaintop experience. There are challenges along the way. Amen? We get challenged. It's the challenges, I think, that make us stronger in our faith. It's those mountaintop experiences that help us to fill in the valleys for those who were there to bring healing, to bring comfort, to bring wholeness, to lift one another up when we're in those valleys. Knowing that someday we're going to come down off the hill and maybe we will be in the valley. And who will we have but our God and our brothers and sisters in Christ to help? The trouble is, sometimes we get on the mountain and we play king of the mountain. You ever play that game when you were a kid? Play king of the mountain, you got up on top of that hill and everyone else had to try to get you off of it? Sometimes as Christians, I think that's what we play, king of the hill. We're... we're we're going good in our faith, man. And everything is the way I want it. The sun is shining. I'm not blessed. And if you're down in the valley, it's you sinner, you. You don't deserve to be on top of the hill. <clears throat> Why do you think God said to take care of the hills? He said it so that all people would see the glory of God together. Together is the last word in that phrase. So that all people would see the glory of God together. Isn't that why we're the church? I have this path that God I'm on. It is comforting to me. I'm close to God. God's close to me. When God is close to me, I'm comforted. I can feel God's presence. I know God's in control. God's in charge. I'm comforted. I'm comforted. Comfort. I'm blessed to bless. I'm forgiven to forgive. Amen? And that's why we share the path, that straight path. We take the curves out of it that make it difficult for people to come to God. We lower the mountains and raise the valleys so that we can see the glory of God together. We don't need people in the valley. And we don't try to keep people off the mountaintop. That's not faith. That's just cruel. Well, we can do that as a church as well. A church that says we're hospitable, but fails to greet the people who come in the front door. I can remember one church in the Kansas City District. Me and my wife went to visit it. It was a big church. And we stood there in that hallway. And there must have been 300 people that passed us. And nobody said welcome. Nobody welcomed us to that church. Can you believe it? Then the pastor, who's a good friend of mine, walked out and I told him he was furious. He was absolutely furious that no one, that 
and said, hello to us. Or can we show you? If we're going to be hospitable, we can't assume that the person sitting next to us greeted the strangers. We have to assume that no one's greeted that person and we have to welcome them to church. Amen? And if we do that, we make the path a lot straighter, don't we? We also have to assume that everybody has a right to be here. When we say it's our church, we have to be very careful that we're not welcoming because we're protecting our church. You know what I'm talking about? You understand what I'm saying? The front doors are not exclusively ours. We don't guard them to see who's going to come in that we might approve or disapprove of. Churches have problems with that, you know. I pastored a church. There was a group in it called the Young Builders Club. The Young Builders Club. They've been together for a number of years because the average age of that Bible study group was 70. The Young Builders. It, young Builders had been together a long time. You couldn't get in that group with a crowbar. I guarantee you. They become an exclusive little group inside the church. Even when I visited that Bible study class, I felt really uneasy. It wasn't welcoming. We have to make sure that we're not making our church exclusive. That as individuals, we're welcoming people. You know, Celia Hahn in her book, Lay Voices in an Open Church, says that people fail to attend church because they feel they have to be perfect before they can sit in the pews. And it's the people in the pews that make them feel that. That can't be us. That's setting up barriers to that road to God. We have to watch who we are. We have to be the church. We have to make sure that we're helping people to Jesus in any way we can. We have to share our Savior. That's what being a disciple means. We have to make sure that we're not making the road crooked for people to come to Christ. We have to make sure that we're not keeping people in the valley while we're up on the hill. That we level the ground. Again, so all people will see the glory of God together. Together. That's our mission. Isn't it? That's why we're the church. Comfort ye. Oh, comfort ye my people. We are people who lived in separation from God, and we were welcomed into the presence of God by God's grace. But we were comforted to comfort. This week, this holiday season, this Advent, if you know the peace of that Advent candle, because you know Christ, then you must go forward and be peacemakers. People who help others to know the peace of Christ. So that they too may know the comfort that Isaiah was talking about. In Jesus' name, amen.